Thank you all for coming. I, my name is Michael Wien. I'm on the adjunct faculty. I want to thank, first of all, the Labian family for sponsoring the, um, uh, the lecture today and the Immune Deficiency Foundation for allowing us uh, um, to uh, uh, work under their auspices. Um, I guess the, the only two other things I wanted to say is that uh, I hope after today's lecture uh, people have a better understanding of severe combined immunodeficiency and how important it is to recognize it because it's almost totally curable if found within the first three and a half months and almost totally fatal if it's not treated. Um, and uh, we're, I am I'm extremely uh, proud to be bringing you Dr. Luigi Natarangelo today, who, uh, in my opinion, is one of the um, foremost immunologists in the world. He is uh, the chief of uh, research on primary immunodeficiencies and molecular diagnosis at uh, Harvard University. Um, his uh, CV is quite extensive. I won't uh, uh, list his uh, innumerable accomplishments, except to tell you that he's uh, been instrumental in delineating several different forms of uh, immunodeficiency, including the first ever chemokine-based immune deficiency, uh, also uh, uh, the CD40 ligand story, and also the JAK-STAT uh, uh, signaling uh, pathway. Um, uh, I'm not going to get into these things, just to tell you that, that I am extremely pleased to have him here, and I hope you'll all give him a warm welcome. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It was really a pleasure for me to be here with Dr. Wynn in these days and to be with you today and share with you um, some uh, new findings in, uh, um, that have clinical implications. I will mostly focus on clinical uh, stuff today in the recognition and treatment of severe combined immunodeficiency. As Dr. Wynn told you, um, I've been working in my career mostly to understand the molecular and cellular basis of these disorders uh, but now time has come that we can turn these um, findings into something that is really uh, helpful to the patients, and I think um, um, this is the time to present this stuff. So I want to start by giving you three uh, snapshots of three cases, um, and you will see the differences between three, these three cases. Case number one uh, was a baby girl born at term, um, nothing wrong during gestation, looked absolutely healthy at, at birth, and then at seven weeks, she developed thrush, otitis media, what was considered to be bronchitis. And the parents noticed that she was starting to um, um, lose weight or actually failed to gain weight, and then eventually had weight loss and developed pneumonia. At four months, she again was hospitalized with a respiratory distress. Uh, they found her to be anemic. They gave her, at that time, an irradiated blood transfusion, uh, which she would never do in this situation anymore. And uh, right after the blood transfusion, a few days later, she developed um, generalized skin rash and a high fever. Uh, and then at that point, uh, they ran a CBC and they noticed that she was extremely lymphopenic. Um, unfortunately, uh, this infant died uh, in a matter of a few days, so five months of age, um, she was dead. And they did a postmortem examination. What the postmortem examination uh, showed was severe depletion of lymphoid cells in the thymus, in the spleen, and in the lymph nodes. And that's case number one. Uh, the second case um, is a case that I took care of personally when I was in Italy. Um, this was a baby boy, uh, nothing wrong at birth. Um, he had some other issues um, uh, at four weeks of age, but at four months presented again with respiratory symptoms, uh, was diagnosed with left lobe pneumonia, and had a worsening of the symptoms in spite of antibiotic treatment, and also started developing protracted diarrhea and failed to thrive. So again, you see the same symptoms over and over like in the first case. Uh, indeed, he was found to have a bilateral interstitial pneumonia at five months of life. And at that point, um, you notice here that also he was extremely lymphopenic. They measured his immunoglobulins and they were absent, so he was panhypogamma globulinemia. And in this case, but not in the first case, they looked at T and, lymph and B lymphocyte subsets and NK cells. And what they showed uh, was, in fact, that he was uh, completely missing T cells. CD3 is a marker for T, for T cells. He didn't have any B cells in peripheral blood either, and virtually all of his lymphocytes were NK cells. So, uh, so the new thing here, as compared to the, to the first presentation, is that we went one step farther in the diagnostic process and actually identified, in addition to the lymphopenia, other, other uh, hallmarks of the disease, uh, in particular, the striking T, and in this case, also B-cell lymphopenia and the panhypogamma globulinemia. I have to say that this patient, right after he was diagnosed with his condition, uh, he did receive a bone marrow transplant and now is a perfectly healthy uh, teenager. The third case um, came to my attention in 2010. 
And this is a baby boy, the second in birth order, born at term, um, nothing wrong, uh, was discharged um, at day four. He only had one, two episodes of mild desaturation that self-resolved at day one of life. And this is all what he had at the time he was made a diagnosis. Okay, so what do these three cases have in common? They all are cases of severe combined immunodeficiency. What is the difference? The time. Um, the first case is actually the first presentation uh, ever reported of severe combined immunodeficiency in humans. It was reported by Glanzmann, um, who some of you will remember, um, uh, was a prominent uh, physician. He identified a number of platelet issues. Um, and it was reported in 1950 uh, in, a, in, a, in a German journal. Uh, and that's the first uh, report of SCID in humans. Um, but that, bo- that baby uh, girl was born in, f- in 1948. So at that time, we knew nothing about T cells, B cells. And we barely knew what lymphocytes are doing in our body. So the, the physicians, Glanzmann and Rieniger, were very smart in uh, recognizing lymphopenia as the hallmark of the disease, because that really changed uh, the way we looked at these patients. The second patient uh, b- was born in 2004. Um, and, and, and was published in 2006, and as I said, this patient received transplant, and the third patient was, in fact, in fact, the first patient ever identified by newborn screening for severe combined immunodeficiency in Massachusetts last year. Okay, so we're talking about um, heterogeneous group of disorders, and you will see that they are heterogeneous. Uh, they all have in common uh, that uh, the T cell development is disrupted. And because they have a problem with the T cells, of course they are incapable of producing mature uh, cytotoxic T cells, which are crucial in protecting us against viruses. They also lack helper T cells, and the helper T cells on the one hand also help um, interact with dendritic cells and macrophages and uh, getting rid of fungi or other uh, opportunistic pathogens, but of course they also provide as key signals to the B lymphocytes and facilitate the terminal differentiation of the B cell lymphocytes into immunoglobulin producing cells. So these patients, uh, just for the lack of the T cells and forget about problems that they may or may not have in a B cell compartment, they are impaired in their production of antibodies. And because of these, of course, their response to bacterial infections is also impaired. So infants with SCID who have a problem in T cell development are extremely vulnerable uh, with regard to infection sustained by viruses, fungi, bacteria. And so this is a typical um, case of SCID. Um, you see the uh, severe um, dystrophy in this infant. Uh, they present very early in life. So this is a clear difference um, as compared to antibody deficiencies. We're all born, uh, if we're born full term, we're all born with maternally derived immunoglobulins. And those maternal immunoglobulins would last for a few months. So even if, if, we, are, if, we, even if we are born with a genetic defect that makes us as unable to produce immunoglobulins, because of the presence of the maternal IgG, patients who are A-gamma globulinemic, in fact, they will start developing infections and mostly bacterial infections after, let's say, four to six months of life. But these patients who are born with no T cells, they're also extremely vulnerable to all kinds of pathogens, and their presentation typically occurs in the very first few months of life, as I showed in the case number one and case number two, who had infections since very, very early. And they are severe infections. Rather than having multiple recurrent infections, sinopulmonary infections, they present with really life-threatening infections. And typically, interstitial pneumonia, chronic diarrhea, they do have oral thrush. And, and, and the other interesting thing is that you find opportunistic pathogens, and I'll go to that in a, ma- in a moment, quite often. They do have failure to thrive. If you do a CBC, you will find that the vast majority of them will have lymphopenia. Not all, but if you find a low lymphocyte count in this setting, think about SCID. Uh, it's present in about 60% of the infants, uh, the lymphopenia. Sometimes you do not see the lymphopenia, and if you look for T cells, you will find the T cells. And so what is the reason? Well, that you may have maternal T cells that pass through the placenta, and they actually are not rejected by the fetus because the fetus is immunocompromised, and they proliferate. And they may even cause a kind of a graft versus source disease in, uh, in, 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 in the newborn. So you will, you will see skin rash and other manifestations, liver disease and others. Uh, these conditions is lethal, and it's inevitably, inevitably lethal. 
and it's lethal within the first two years of life. However, these patients can be cured by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. It can be cured for life. So talking about pathogens, uh, not just bacteria, but uh, these, pa these subjects are extremely susceptible to a number of opportunistic pathogens, including candida, pneumocystis, very common um, explanation for the interstitial pneumonia. But you really were a cytomegalovirus uh, that may cause also pneumonia, it may cause liver disease, but you really worry about these two guys here, adenovirus and parainfluenza virus type 3. And why is that? Because we do have good drugs like cotrimoxazole to fight pneumocystis. We have relatively good drugs now against cytomegalovirus, but we have very little against adenovirus and parainfluenza virus type 3. So once these patients develop this kind of infection, then it's really hard. The other thing that one has to be aware of is that in many countries, um, immunization against tuberculosis is given at birth uh, with a live attenuated mycobacterium, um, with the BCG vaccine. And in these patients, because this is a live viral, a live vaccine, uh, it will actually cause disease. So you will see lymph lymphadenopathy, which you wouldn't expect, and the, and, and, and the BCG will disseminate through the body and may actually uh, result in death. The other thing, which is also important for this country, where the rotavirus vaccine is given uh, at few months of life, these patients are extremely susceptible also to the rotavirus vaccine because, again, it's a live attenuated virus. And there have been already cases of skid babies who have developed fatal disease following rotavirus immunization. So you want to be absolutely sure that there is no immunodeficiency at the time you give this type of vaccine. Okay, so this is the original uh, paper. Uh, by Glantzman and Rieniker, and I just wanted to emphasize that they recognize uh, the lymphopenia as the hallmark of the disease. What this means means um, idiopathic uh, lymphopenia. And uh, a few years later, also in German, um, a Swiss doctor, Walter Itzke, uh, described another case of alymphocytosis with a gamma globulinemia and lack of uh, lymphatic tissue. So even at a time when we really had no ways to distinguish T from B cells, from NK cells, we had no clues what the T cells do, no clues what the B cells do, these doctors identified lymphocytes as key components of the immune responses, and the lack of lymphocytes in particular as responsible for severe combined immunodeficiency. And the lymphopenia, in fact, is true and affects all kinds of skid disorders, uh, this is a review from uh, uh, Becky Buckley at Duke University, uh, looking here at the number of lymphocytes as compared to what the normal range for age would be. And remember that lymphocyte count is higher early in life. Don't ever use the adult values to compare to what you see in uh, babies. Uh, but these are all forms of severe combined immune deficiency that she followed. And you will see that across the board, uh, these patients, regardless of the genetic nature of the disease, they clearly had a marked lymphopenia. But there is significant heterogeneity. Um, I showed you at least the two cases that shared exactly the same clinical features. And for the most part, infants with skid do present in a very similar manner. But there is, in fact, some clinical or phenotypic heterogeneity, which I won't comment on. There are distinctive features of some forms of skid versus others. I want to comment a little bit about the immunological heterogeneity and the genetic heterogeneity, because in these days, one really has to go one step farther, not just make the diagnosis. The diagnosis is essential to prompt treatment, but you want to be a bit more sophisticated in your diagnosis. You want to understand also what specific form of skid the baby has, because that's important for genetic counseling and also to allow, if, if, if the family wants so, prenatal diagnosis or even pre-implantation diagnosis. So this is my own series of cases that I saw uh, in, when I was in Italy of various kinds of skid. And the point I want to make here, um, if you look at, uh, if you focus on the T cells, and this is again the normal range, once again, like Becky Buckley showed, uh, there is a T cell lymphopenia, a, a striking T cell lymphopenia across the board, regardless of the nature of the genetic defect. However, uh, look at here, some forms of skid come with a normal or even increased number of B cells, whereas others, have actually undetectable B cells. So now you have two broad categories, the T minus B minus and the T minus B plus. And if you focus on NK cells, uh, you will find that some forms of, NK, of skid come with a normal number of NK cells and others will have almost no NK cells. So 
as a result of this, in these days, simply by using monoclonal antibodies that recognize T cells, CD3, B cells, CD19, and NK cells, CD16 or 56, one can distinguish four major subgroups of severe combined immunodeficiencies. And these are the T minus B plus NK minus, B plus NK plus, T minus B minus NK minus, T minus B minus NK plus, all combinations. The intriguing thing is that in the late 90s, when um, several of these genes were actually identified, it was appreciated that each of these, sorry, each of these groups actually consists of multiple genetic defects. So the number of skid disorders is actually increasing more and more year after year. And even this year, there have been a couple of papers uh, describing new cases, new forms of severe combined immunodeficiency. The study of these disorders and of these very rare patients has been essential to identify key events in human lymphoid development. Um, you, may, you may tend to believe that uh, we can do everything with mice. We can disrupt gene in mice. That's true. We can even knock in a mutation in mice. But there are two things to consider. Number one, you do in mice what you already think makes sense. And in fact, uh, some of these skid disorders have not been uh, reproduced in mice simply because they were unexpected findings. Uh, they found genetic defects in genes that they didn't think might result in a block in T-cell development, and that's one thing. The second thing is that the human T-cell development and even the human B-cell development is not exactly like the mouse T-cell development and mouse T-B-cell development. There are significant differences. And so the study of patients gives a unique opportunity to understand what the immune system works in humans. And I'm going to give you just one example how the study of severe combined immunodeficiencies in humans has identified key events that regulate T-cell development. So, of course, you'd need a thymus. Uh, the thymus is the school where the lymphocytes go and are educated and become eventually uh, T-lymphocytes. And so there is one condition in which uh, you lack a transcription factor, which is called FOXN1. This is crucial uh, for the thymic stroma development and maturation. If you, if you are mutated in FOXN1, uh, the thymic stroma doesn't work properly. It doesn't function very well. You don't have cortical and medullary thymic epithelial cells. Interestingly enough, in mice, you do have an equivalent of this. It's a nude mouse. Uh, so this was known. Uh, so these patients, because they don't have a thymus, they cannot produce T cells. And they also have, you know, hair problems like in the, skin, like in the nude mouse. Then let's assume you have now a common lymphoid progenitor. These cells have to expand a lot in the thymus. You start with few cells that colonize the thymus, and eventually you end up with millions of cells that are released to the periphery. That requires proliferation. It also requires survival of the cells. So if you have a problem with cell survival, uh, then you end up having an empty thymus. And this is what happens in some conditions that result in skin in humans, in particular um, adenosine deaminase deficiency or nucleoside phosphorylase deficiency, so enzyme defects. And here's another enzyme, adenylate kinase 2, that affects even an earlier stage in uh, lymphoid development. And interestingly enough, it also blocks neutrophil differentiation, not monocytes, but neutrophils. So these patients don't have any neutrophil. They don't have any T cell. They're also deaf. They have sensory neural deafness because of the lack of this enzyme that resides in the mitochondria. And this is one example of a gene defect that doesn't exist in mice, has not been reproduced in mice, and we only learned this from studying humans. Uh, and then you, you have this uh, common lymphoid progenitor that sits to the thymus, uh, becomes a double negative cell, has to proliferate a lot in response to growth factors, and a key growth factor for development of T cells is interleukin-7. Um, I think, yeah. And so if you are mutated in the receptor for interleukin-7, or if you're mutated in the common gamma chain, which associates with the interleukin-7 receptor, is also a component of other cytokine receptors for IL-2, IL-4, IL-9, IL-15, and IL-21, or if you are mutated in JAK3, which is a kinase immediately downstream from the common gamma chain, that you, then you are impaired in the ability of these progenitors to proliferate in response to IL-7. And so again, you end up with an empty thymus and no T cells. That's another difference with mice. Uh, IL-7 deficiency or any of these defects in mice would also abrogate B cell development 
In humans, this is not the case because IL-7 in humans is not essential for B cell development. And so these patients have no T cells, but they have a normal number of B cells. Okay, what is the next stage? Well, T cells is a T cells because eventually it does express a receptor, a T cell receptor. And before expressing a T cell receptor, these cells express what is called a pre-T cell receptor that is composed of the T cell receptor beta chain and a pre-T alpha chain. And this requires the rearrangement of the DNA. And there are some genes which are crucial to recognize uh, the variable, the diversity, and the joining elements of the T cell receptor, RAG1 and RAG2. And there are genes that are involved in the DNA repair. And so if you have a problem with any of these genes, you disrupt the so-called VDJ recombination process. You cannot express a pre-T cell receptor, and the cells will not proceed further along T cell development. The T cell receptor is expressed in association with CD3 chains, the gamma, the delta, the epsilon, and the zeta chain of the CD3, which mediates signal transduction. So even if you have a pre-T cell receptor normally expressed, because there is nothing wrong with these, but you have a mutation in one of these CD3 chains, you're unable to deliver signals. And by the same mechanism, therefore, the cells will not proceed any further in T cell development. So many uh, different genetic defects resulting in a common clinical phenotype of severe combined immunodeficiency. Now, what is the frequency and the relative distribution of all of these defects? Um, if you read the literature, um, you will um, mainly find data, again, from Dr. Buckley in this country. And if you look at her own series of patients with severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, you will realize that almost half of their patients were males, and they were affected by X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency, which is due to mutation of the common gamma chain, which I showed you before. I contrasted this with my own experience in Italy, so again, another Western country, but if you look at the distribution of various kinds of severe combined immune deficiency there, you, you will realize that, yes, we did have excellent skid, but it was clearly not as common as in the United States, and we had many other uh, forms of autosomal recessive uh, severe combined immune deficiency. So the key point I want to make here is that depending on the uh, geographical situation, on the ethnicity, and perhaps also on the higher or lower degree of consanguinity, as well as presence of uh, ethnic and uh, isolates within a population, you may have a situation where you have more or less of autosomal recessive forms, more or less of excellent skid forms. So I told you this is a lethal disease, but it can be cured. And I think we all have to pay a tribute to Bob Good. Uh, who changed our way of treating not just skid, but quite a number of human disorders by bone marrow transplantation. So the first time that bone marrow transplantation was successfully performed in humans was, in fact, in a child with X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency, and this is the original paper. Um, and now we use bone marrow transplant for quite a number of disorders. Um, it does work, and again, I look, this is again my own original series of patients, and remember this slide where I contrasted the number of TB and NK cells in various forms. This is what happened after the transplantation at follow-up. These patients uh, reconstituted their T cell compartment. They normalized their B and NK cell compartment as well. So simply by doing bone marrow transplantation, you fully restore uh, the immune um, system in these individuals, and you make them survive. What can we say? The first transplant was done in 68, so at least we know for sure that transplant is going to last uh, 40, 40, 49, 40, 43, 44 years. Hopefully, it will last actually 90 years. We all hope that the transplant is as effective. Okay, so we would like the bone marrow transplantation to be um, a procedure that can be done rapidly. Uh, we would like it to be cheap with, without any side effects. 100% um, effective, and like I said, we would like it to last 90, 90 years. I don't know about the last one, but none of the others are true, unfortunately. And why is that? Well, there are many factors that um, impinge on the outcome of transplantation. The type of the donor and the degree of matching of the HLA system and the alleles between the donor and the recipient. That's a key factor. I would say it is the most important factor. In some cases, the nature of the cell defect uh, matters. I would say that this is more important, the age of the patient and particularly the clinical status at transplantation, but also the year 
in which the transplant has been made. Uh, there has been continuous and tremendous progress in the outcome of transplantation. So the results are clearly better now than they were in 1968. Still, there is transplant-related toxicity. And so the kind of drugs you use or you don't use uh, to prepare the recipient for the engraftment uh, also may um, affect the outcome. Uh, when you transplant from another donor, there is always a chance, even in the actually identical setting, uh, there is always a chance of creating a graft versus host disease where the lymphocytes that are contained or derived from the bone marrow cells from the donor actually react against the body of the recipient. This is what the graft versus host disease is, and it may happen in an acute or a chronic uh, fashion. And then it depends also the um, ability to reconstitute uh, various lineage with donor-derived cells. That also is important uh, in regard to the ability to reconstitute the immune function and so the quality of immune reconstitution eventually has an impact on outcome and survival. So I want to make uh, one point that we have uh, several type of donors available nowadays. Uh, the best donor is always an actually identical sibling donor because uh, by definition it shares uh, full HLA haplotypes with the uh, patient and it may also be matched on minor loci. So the, the chance of graft versus host disease in this setting is very, very low. It's not zero, but it's very, very low. But most of the times we don't have such a donor uh, because families are small and because the chance of having a, an actually identical donor is, of course, theoretically only one out of four. But with small families, this is becoming more and more uh, unlikely. So what we do have uh, virtually in every single case is one of the parents available. And so there would be a haploidentical transplantation. The problem with this transplant is that the bone marrow uh, from these patients, from these donors, of course, contains T cells, and those T cells are not matched to the recipient. So if you inject the marrow as such, those T cells will reject the recipient. They will cause a fatal graft versus host disease. So you need to remove the T cells from the marrow of the haploidentical father or, or mother. And you have various strategies to do this, and the, the, the strategy you use has an impact on the outcome. So it's not true that each strategy is equivalent to the other. Another possibility we have is to use an adult unrelated donor and search worldwide for match unrelated donors. And this is becoming more and more popular now that the number of donors in the registries is increasing. But again, you have then different options. You can use unfractionated bone marrow, or you can say, well, you know, yes, but it is an unrelated donor. I want to take the T cells out. And so you can do a T cell depleted bone marrow, or you can purify the stem cells from the unrelated donor marrow. And finally, you can use cord blood, and with cord blood, you really inject what you have, so unfractionated. So why is this relevant, and how does it affect the outcome of transplantation? I'm, I'm giving you only two cartoons to contrast what happens in the actually identical sibling transplantation versus the haploidentical transplantation. This is what happens after match-related donor, sibling, actually identical transplantation. The marrow, you use the marrow as such, and the marrow contains stem cells, but it also contains T cells. And these T cells, after they are injected into the recipient, they will immediately proliferate. And these are mature cells. So they will become immediately memory-activated T cells, which do have some specificity, so they will defend the recipient against the antigens that they are specific to. So if you have a donor that, for instance, has seen CMV, cytomegalovirus, you will immediately provide protection to the recipient against the cytomegalovirus just by giving full marrow that contains CMV-specific T cells. It will take a long time, four to six months, before the stem cells that go through the thymus generate what are, in fact, naive T cells in the recipient. So the generation of new T cells takes a long time, takes four to six months. And all what you have before then is the immune reconstitution due to mature T cells contained in the graft. Now contrast this with what happens in the, um, right, so that's what the match related donor. So contrast this with what happens with the haploidentical transplantation. And this is what happens here. So you have to take the T cells out of the bone marrow because otherwise they would cause, as we, as we mentioned, fatal graft versus host disease. 
So now you're relying entirely upon the stem cells to go through the thymus and generate the T cells. And again, this takes four to six months. In this period of time, the recipient who has received the bone marrow transplantation remains extremely vulnerable to all kinds of infection. And this explains why, if you look at the outcome, survival, following actually identical or genoidentical transplantation versus hoploidentical transplantation, you will clearly see that there is a striking difference in survival. These are data that come also from Europe, because in Europe since 1968, uh, the centers are actually collecting all of the data on their uh, primary immunodeficiency patients transplanted in a single registry. And so we have now quite a large number of, of patients in, in this registry, which we don't have in the United States. We just started doing this. Uh, but you can clearly see that there is a striking difference. You also will realize that even if you consider patients who were transplanted in 1968, and if you focus on those that received actual identical transplantation, you have over 80% survival rate. In reality, if you focus on patients who received transplant in the last five years, if you are transplanted from an actually identical sibling, you actually are able to cure more than 95% of these patients now. So it's a remarkable success for an otherwise lethal disease. Okay, now why newborn screening? Well, because of this issue of extreme vulnerability of infants with SCID to infection, uh, people thought that early recognition of SCID may be, in fact, key uh, to promote, promote survival and quality of life after transplantation. Is this true? Well, there, was a, there were two observations that, in fact, proved the fact. Uh, this study was published this year. It's a retrospective study from London. Okay, I'll, I'll guide you through this. So in this case, you had a proband cord and a sibling cord. The proband cord is actually um, represented by the first child with skid identified in this family. And the sibling's cord is represented by other sisters or brothers of the proband who were also diagnosed with skid. Okay, so now look at what happens at the proband um, as compared to the siblings. Death before transplant, of course much higher in the probands, because many of these were actually diagnosed only after they had severe life-threatening infections, and some of them, even if they were recognized correctly, they died. There was nothing that actually could be done to save them. The pre-transplant death rate was very low in the siblings, simply because the families and the doctors were aware of what's going on. And so they knew that these were at-risk cases, and they tested them, for lymphoid numbers, T, B, and K function, and they were able to cure them by transplant most of the times before they develop a severe infection. But even among those that went to transplant, the death rate was clearly different. 39% in the problem cord versus 8.5% in a sibling cord. Why? Because many of these patients went to transplant when they were sick. And as I mentioned before, going to transplant with an active infection poses you at high risk of death, which was not the case in a vast majority of those that went to transplant in the sibling cord. So that's good evidence. And so the overall survival was, of course, much higher in the sibling cord, 90%, versus the program cord, 40%. In this country, Becky Buckley has also provided uh, key evidence that transplanting skid babies early in life uh, makes a difference. She contrasted um, survival in infants at her center that received transplant at less than 3.5 months of age versus those that received transplant at more than 3.5 months of age. And, and they were treated in the same way. These were identical transplant, T-cell depleted, no conditioning, and there was a striking difference. So these led people to think that we need to, go to do something to recognize these babies at birth before they develop infections. How to do this? Well, so first of all, let me repeat then, let me emphasize why diagnose kid early, establish a diagnosis, institute treatment, avoid diagnostic odyssey. You can't imagine that these babies go from hospital to hospital. These are rare diseases and you need to know them before you know, make a diagnosis. So quite often they've gone through multiple hospitalizations. You, you want to provide families with genetic diagnosis and counseling. From a scientific standpoint, we want to know what is the actual incidence of SCID and what type of SCIDs we have in this country. Uh, we want to educate providers and public about SCID. And finally, we want to collaborate to determine optimal treatment, which we don't know what it is in reality. 
Okay, so how do we make, how to make an early diagnosis of skid? Well, again, remember what happens during T-cell development. I told you that a key event is the assembly of the T-cell receptor genes. And in particular, most of the T-cells will eventually express an alpha-beta form of the T-cell receptor. What is interesting in the alpha locus is that within the alpha locus, you have the delta locus embedded. And so if you are, at this point, deciding that this cell is becoming a, a, a T-cell receptor alpha-beta expressing cell, what happens if you bring together a variable and a J element of the alpha locus and you delete um, the intervening sequence that includes the delta locus. And this, this sequence is actually circularized and remains within the cell as an episome. And it's called T-cell receptor excision circle or TREC. So during T-cell development, you do have that the majority of the T cells that are being generated in the thymus become TREC positive, and then they eventually become either CD4 or CD8, and they are released to the periphery. So the T cells that have just been released from the thymus, they do contain these episomes, these T cell receptor excision circles. And you can use PCR, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction, to amplify the TREC signal. And so the amount of TREC signal that you have in your peripheral blood in a, in, a, in, in a way, is an indication of how good your thymic function is, how capable are you to produce T lymphocytes. And you can do this by simply taking a Guthrie card, extracting DNA, and enumerating the, the track levels. And you compare these with, uh, of course, you have to use an internal normalizer. In this case, was RNASP, so you amplify also for another unrelated um, a genetic sequence, in this case RNA-SP, which is what we use also in Massachusetts. And this is what this Japanese group did. This was a retrospective study of Guthrie cards from skid babies. And so you see that they have nothing wrong with rna -SP, but here are the track levels in the controls and in the skid babies. And all of them were out of range. This ADA deficient patient had a little bit of tracks, but clearly abnormal as compared to the controls, and all of the others had undetectable track levels. So we do have a powerful assay in place to make a diagnosis of skid at birth without doing any expensive and fancy test, just retrieving DNA from the Guthrie card, which we are collecting anyhow. So um, basically this was discussed for a long time in this country. And eventually, um, and I want to make uh, this story short, um, in, in 2007, SCID was nominated for addition to the universal panel of conditions that can be screened uh, in uh, neonatal age. Wisconsin was the first state in this country to start the screening for SCID in January 2008. We were the second state in February 2009, and then was nominated again for the addition to universal panel, and now uh, it was eventually recommended uh, for this addition. So there are many, many more states now that are embarking on this, and Florida is actually considering this. I know there are financial issues, but hopefully this will be solved. This is the current situation of the United States, where you have several states that are running uh, the newborn screening on all babies at birth, including some well-populated states like California. And there are others uh, that are um, on their way uh, to do the screening. And I'm going to give you uh, the uh, results uh, so far of this experience and, and, and compare what the frequency of SCID is in the, in the different states in this country. So these are uh, five states that are running active newborn screening for severe combined immunodeficiency. I have uh, rough estimates for California of the denominator of SCID babies that have been, of the babies that have been screened, but all of the others are accurate numbers. And so altogether, uh, there have been 19 babies with SCID identified with an overall frequency of one in 58,000 babies. Uh, originally, the idea was the skid would affect one in 100,000 babies, so it's uh, twice as much. So obviously, we're seeing babies that probably would have died uh, being undiagnosed. Um, also, it's remarkable that the frequency is pretty much uh, the same in these different states. So uh, this is good evidence, that actually, the data um, are accurate. What happened to these 19 babies? Well. 17 of them, in fact, had a real skid condition. Two had um, combined immunodeficiency associated with other um, situations, uh, um, and, and one of them was actually unexpected. Of these 17, again, you see all kinds of genetic defects. Once again, excellent skid now appears to be only one-third uh, or less than one-third of the skid babies, so more similar to the European situation than to the experience that had been reported by Dr. Buckley at a single center. 19 patients, three 
have adenosine deaminase deficiency, so they have received enzyme replacement therapy, and one of them actually is now receiving gene therapy. Two of the 19 are awaiting transplant, so we're left with 14 of them, and they have been transplanted. 13 out of 14 are alive. So again, a remarkable success for a lethal condition. Uh, all of these uh, have been transplanted, all of the 14, and 13 out of the 14 are, are alive. One died of venoclusive disease, which is a complication of chemotherapy given pre-transplantation, and tells us that maybe we have to design different ways to treat these babies so early in life uh, in, to prepare them for transplant. But, it, but there, is, there is clearly room for research, but I think these data clearly confirm the efficacy of the newborn screening for SCID in saving the life of several babies who would otherwise uh, reasonably die. All right. So in spite of all of these and all of the good that I told you about transplantation, we're still left with the idea that, and that uh, mortality still affects 20 to 40 percent of these patients. You have problems of antibody production long term in many of them, 30 to 60 percent. There is some evidence that there may be decline of T cell function, particularly if you use a haploidentical unconditioned transplantation. And there are other issues that impact on the uh, quality of life of these patients following transplantation. So because of these, people thought that there has to be something different than bone marrow transplant uh, to cure these babies. And what they wanted to focus on for many years has been gene therapy. There has been the idea that gene therapy uh, may actually represent a cure uh, for these disorders uh, without uh, graft versus source disease because you would take the very same stem cells from the patients, uh, genetically manipulate them by uh, injecting um, a, normal, a, a virus that would encode a normal copy uh, of, the, uh, of the disease gene, and by doing this, you would reinfuse the cells, genetically corrected cells, and generate now a normal uh, T and B cell uh, repertoire in these patients. Well, things haven't been um, so successful. Uh, it has taken a long time uh, to get gene therapy going. Uh, eventually, things appear to be, um, to be better than, uh, uh, than originally looked. Uh, in particular, uh, the experience by Alain Fischer in Paris in excellent severe combined immunodeficiency clearly proved uh, that one can cure these babies just by doing gene therapy without giving any other kind of treatment. Um, so once again, uh, excellent severe combined immunodeficiency is a disorder where you have a mutation in the common gamma chain, and because of these, cells don't proliferate to IL-7, so you're completely blocked in the uh, T cell development at a very early stage. So his idea was, well, let's put a, now the common gamma chain into the stem cells of the patient and reinfuse the cells. Uh, not all of the cells will be genetically corrected, but only the genetically corrected ones will respond to IL-7 and will eventually produce T cells, which is what has been seen in uh, 20 patients uh, that have been treated between London and Paris. So Alain Fischer in Paris, Adrian Thresher in London. And in these uh, two different trials, they used a retroviral vector um, containing the common gamma chain whose expression was driven by the viral long terminal repeats, strong enhancers uh, to promote expression of the transgene. And this is what happened. So these are the T cell count at day zero, and then they go up and up and up and eventually become normal uh, by around day 90 in these 20 patients. However, uh, and the overall results were, were that of these 20 patients, 18 are currently alive, 17 uh, as a result, in fact, of gene therapy. One patient did require a bone marrow transplantation, so this is the difference. Um, and there were uh, two cases uh, who didn't make it, and one of the two cases is particularly relevant to the discussion I want to make now, which is, in fact, that out of these 20 patients, five develop leukemia. Um, they develop leukemic proliferation as a result of insertion of mutagenesis of the transgene uh, near oncogenes. And, and, and it was a T cell leukemia in uh, all of these cases, and one of them didn't respond to treatment. And so this is the other death um, of the two that I mentioned uh, in this slide. So uh, if you look at um, where the gene where the gene went uh, in these five cases, uh, there was one oncogene that was targeted in four of them, the LMO2 proto-oncogene, which is actively expressed early during hematopoiesis. So the chromatin is released, and that maybe facilitates uh, targeting of this locus by the retrovirus. So obviously, <clears throat> this experience indicated, yes, that gene therapy can cure actually in severe combined immunodeficiency and maybe other conditions as well, but something has to be done 
to improve safety of the vectors. And so there has been a lot, a lot of work going on um, since uh, this was published until now. And in particular, uh, the vector for X-Lens kit now has been modified, and we are uh, participating at a multi-institutional trial of gene therapy for X-Lens kit with a new vector. And these are the modifications. This is the original vector that was used in London and Paris. Again, the common gamma chain whose expression is driven by the um, viral LTR of the Maloney um, urine leukemia virus derived uh, vector. Uh, we're, we have uh, changed this uh, by completely uh, removing the viral LTR and uh, uh, driving the common gamma chain under a, a weak cellular promoter, elongation factor 1 alpha, which is immediately upstream of the transgene. So now we are using a much uh, less strong induction of the transgene. We've also made other modification uh, in the vector by adding this post-translational regulatory element that stabilizes and increases the levels of expression of the common gamma chain to compensate in part for the poor activity of the elongation factor 1 alpha and other modifications have been introduced in the viral backbone to remove as much as possible all of the potentially dangerous sequences that are contained in the, um, in the viral vector itself. So <clears throat> to prove the safety of this vector, Chris Baum in Hanover, with whom we collaborate, has done a series of studies. I'm going to show you just one slide, uh, which, however, um, tells you that, in fact, in vivo, this appears to be a much safer vector. Um, it took mice, took stem cells from the mice, transduced them with the new vector or with the old vector, uh, injected them into primary recipients, and then took bone marrow from these recipients and injected into secondary recipients. If you have immortalization of a cell type, you will eventually see uh, leukemia in the secondary recipients because you're basically injecting a clonally proliferating cell. Um, what, what he also did, uh, he, when, he, when he took the stem cells from the primary recipients, he also un, uh, took part of them and, and did deep sequencing on the bone marrow as well as on the peripheral blood to analyze the integration sites uh, where these had gone. And in particular, focus on one of the classical integration sites, which is EVI1, uh, a proto-oncogen. First of all, let me tell you that none of the secondary recipients uh, ever developed uh, uh, tumors in uh, donor-derived cells, uh, and this was more than 100 mice analyzed. Uh, and secondly, uh, when, we, when he compared the in insertion sites in these proto-oncogenes, EVA1, and he looked at uh, the old vector versus the new vector, there were, in fact, integration using the old vectors. None of the 2,690 insertions that he could identify by deep sequencing with the new vector were, in fact, uh, near this oncogene. So that, in fact, suggests that the new vector should be safer. But the reality is we have to demonstrate this in vivo. So a trial has been approved uh, by the FDA, and this is a multi-institutional trial now, um, which uh, our center leads in the United States, but there are also two other sites, um, Cincinnati Children's and uh, um, uh, Matter Children's Hospital. Now it's actually at UCLA. Um, the, uh, there are two European sites, uh, again, in London and Paris. All of these sites are going to use exactly the same vector, exactly the same protocol for transduction. So this will allow comparison of results in 20 patients treated in the same way. I'm, I want to show you the, share with you the data on the first patient that we treated, uh, who is now 10 months after gene therapy. So this is the protocol. The protocol doesn't involve any chemotherapy. Um, you take the bone marrow uh, from the patient. You select for the CD34 positive cells and uh, uh, do a, a three rounds of transduction upon pre-activating these cells with a cocktail of cytokines. So three rounds of transduction with this gamma, um, self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector, and then reinfuse into the patient. No other therapy in between, no chemo, no nothing. So this is the patient. The patient is actually an Argentinian patient with a positive family history. He had one brother who died of disseminated BCG infection. Remember that I told you about the BCG infection and in infants with skid who received BCG at birth. There was also a maternal uncle who died in the very first few months of life of interstitial pneumonia and uh, chronic diarrhea, so likely a skid baby. Um, when we looked at this baby, um, he did match the criteria in that he had no T cells. These are absolute numbers. A normal number of B cells, low number of NK cells, as you expect for excellent skid. He did carry a mutation in the common gamma chain. He had no matched siblings because otherwise, had this been a match, he would have been the donor, and we wouldn't do gene therapy, of course. And when we looked at common gamma chain expression on the surface of lymphocytes, 
Um, even if this is a mistransmutation, in fact, there was no protein expressed, and this is a staining in control lymphocytes. So he received gene therapy at 5.5 months of age. He presented uh, with oral ulcers, which we were unable to define what the pathogen was. We thought it was herpes simplex, but in fact, we couldn't identify herpes simplex. Um, and pre-gene therapy, a biopsy was made of these oral ulcers that didn't show any lymphocytes, but showed predominantly a neutrophilic infiltrate. Now, at day 50, after gene therapy, when the ulcers actually became more inflamed, uh, we did another biopsy because we were a little bit worried. And surprisingly now, we see a lot of mononuclear cell infiltrate. Not only that, but if you stain for CD3, and this was before we could see any T cells in the peripheral blood, now we see lots of T cells uh, around the ulcers. So suggesting that in fact, remember he didn't have any T cells. So these are truly T cells generated from the transduced bone marrow stem cells which were absolutely absent in the original biopsy. So there was good indication that something was going on, and perhaps he was reconstituting his T-cell compartment. And in fact, this is true. So it took, it took him a little bit longer as compared to the previous trial. Again, this is a weaker promoter, so the gamma chain is expressed at weaker levels, which is good, we think. We don't want you know, a very strong uh, promoter and enhancer to drive expression of transgene. Uh, this is his T-cell count as it's going up now, so now is fully normal, um, good number of CD4 and CD8 cells. Interestingly enough, he also maintains CD1656 and K cells, which were lost in the other 20 patients treated by gene therapy with the other vector. So everything looks good. And when we looked at the T cell function as measured by proliferation of the T lymphocytes in response to fetohemagglutinin, now he has an absolutely normal T cell response. The infant was uh, sent back home when he was five months. He lives in his home in Argentina with his brother and, uh, par and, and, and parents, and he will be back in Boston for the one year evaluation in uh, December. But so far, so good. There are three patients treated in France with the same vector. They're also doing fine. Uh, London, Cincinnati, and Los Angeles haven't enrolled any patients yet. But it looks a promising story. Uh, still too early to say, um, I have to warn you that leukemia was seen also years after gene therapy, so we have to be very cautious. We are required by the FDA to monitor these patients for 15 years after gene therapy, and we definitely do so. This is the last slide um, before the summary, just to show that the common gamma chain is now expressed in his T and NK cells. If you wish, again, you compare the level of expression in the normal as well as and in the patient, you will see that the expression is slightly lower in the patient versus the control. Again, the weak promoter probably driving a little bit less of expression of the common gamma chain, but good enough to allow T and NK and, and B cell reconstitution. Okay, so I want to conclude by saying that SCID is in fact a medical emergency and we should all be aware of this. It is a rare disease, but there are many other rare diseases uh, that are screened by newborn screening, and now we're lucky that we have a newborn screening available also for severe combined immunodeficiency, and we're lucky because we have effective treatment in place, which is predominantly bone marrow transplantation. So we can really save the life of these babies. Um, one has to be one has to keep a very high index of suspicion in these infants. So don't ever wait for recurrence of the infections. If you have a life-threatening infection. Early in life, always think of SCID as a possibility. There are many other more likely possibilities, but SCID should be considered, and it's easy to look at just by doing an absolute lymphocyte count and a T, I would say even only a T cell count is good enough. Um, newborn screening is now possible and, and, and should result, we expect it will result in significant improvement of outcome. Preliminary data already indicate this. But bone marrow transplantation in general is the mainstay of treatment even beyond newborn screening. Um, we do need um, further improvement. In particular, uh, we need improvement in, uh, in, in the ability of, to, to treat uh, some infections, as I told you, like adenovirus, parainfluenza virus. We need better ways to speed up the immune reconstitution. Perhaps we need better ways uh, to uh, treat or not treat by chemotherapy these infants uh, before the transplant. Um, and lastly, SCID has also offered proof of principle gene therapy works, but carries significant risks. And so development of safer vectors and novel approaches, which I didn't talk about, this is something that will probably come in the next decades, real gene correction or targeting safe harbors in our genome to prevent um, random, random insertion of the virus 
uh, near oncogenes um, should lead uh, to improved outcome. Um, this has been really not my work. Um, many people have been involved, um, both in my lab. I want to thank in particular David Williams, who's the sponsor of the excellent skid gene therapy trial in the United States, and Sangyam Pai, um, uh, my bone marrow transplant colleague, uh, works with me on these patients. Um, I mentioned collaboration with many centers um, in the United States, in Europe, um, and also the uh, important work of the newborn sc uh, screening uh, group in Massachusetts for severe combined immunodeficiency. This is really a teamwork. Uh, we work together. Uh, we meet together. Uh, we, re we review all of the cases periodically. It takes some time, but it's been fruitful. And also people from my former institution in Italy because I presented data uh, from them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was 60 years of, of immunological progress put into one hour. And since we don't have a clinical immunologist allergist here on staff, um, I'm depending on all of you folks to be thinking about this when you're seeing patients. Because I'm sure that if you folks paid attention today, you'll save a life. So um, open up for questions. Well, in principle, no, because the idea would be that you would nonetheless select the stem cells. So you, you would purify the stem cells, and you, so you're only targeting one specific type of cell. Um, of course, I mean, um, if there were ways, and there aren't, by the way, to do in vivo gene, gene correction by injecting something into the body and achieving real gene correction, but I don't see how this could be done, then, in theory, there might be a risk of targeting the germline. But if you do this the way that I presented, by isolating the cells you want to target, and then trying to achieve gene correction in those cells, it wouldn't be harmful. There wouldn't be that danger. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for, for uh, I also want to give an update on, on, on what's happening in Florida. It turns out that the, the Florida, le Florida legislature approved uh, the T-Rex screening, which is about $5 per baby. It was uh, vetoed by the governor. I've spoken um, with the Haridopoulos family, and, and uh, they're trying to get it approved again. Um, I think that if you had a baby born, you would pay the $5. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Let's go get you some lunch. One question. Yes. Any rough numbers in terms of cost?